So Dr. Lakshmi Narayan or Rabbanan, if I may, what brought about this second wave? What went wrong? When do you see the worst getting over? What is different this time round? Will we see more such waves? What is the lesson learned? And in the words of my partner, uh, Mr. Gurkarni, what is the different difference between the first and the second wave from uh, epidemiologists perspective? So I have got, uh, an answer, asked quite a few uh, <laughs> questions in the same one, but I, I'll, 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 I'll come back if, if, I, if I see that you missed something. Right. Right. So first of all, uh, let me just say that the second wave that we're in is was certainly not inevitable, right? So a year ago, we had a severe lockdown, and that was because the system was unprepared. People didn't know about the disease, uh, and it was hard to communicate how serious the situation was. Uh, and in order to do that, a lockdown at 500 cases was really the only thing that could be done, and it was imposed to allow us time to prepare us as individuals, at the health systems, for governments, everybody was unprepared. And it really made a big difference because uh, thanks to that lockdown and the urgency, we have more PPEs, we have more masks, we have ventilators, we have oxygen, we have a vaccine that's in full swing, although you know we should talk about that a little more. Uh, but you know, after January, a sense of complacency set in, which is driven by some notion that the disease was really gone. And there was a lot of, you know, chest thumping about how we've done a great job and so forth. And today we see this is not the case. And in fact, in January, and I quote, this is an interview with the Financial Times, and, you know, they asked the question about what do you think will happen after this? And why are cases so low? And I basically said, listen, further moves towards normalcy, such as reopening schools and workplaces, could be accompanied by an other up, an, another uptick in cases as individuals without immunity are exposed to the virus. A lot of this is in the rearview mirror. But that doesn't mean we're done and dusted yet. We have an artificial situation in which we've reached an equilibrium. But if we went back to normal, then there's a lot of room for cases going up. So end of quote, and that is exactly what has happened. So uh, what is happening right now is not surprising at all. It is simply, uh, you know, it's poor science, poor judgment, hubris, and all of these coming together. Uh, uh, and I wouldn't just only blame government. I would say it's everybody, it's, it's society as a whole, I think we've been poorly sound, you know, served by the narrative around this, and you know, uh, you know, to to make predictions about this doesn't require a deep degree of scientific knowledge, right? In the sense that there is something very fundamentally simple about this. You have an entire population; it's a virus that none of us have ever experienced. So some people are infected. It doesn't take rocket science to say, well, the others. What have? What about the others? Why did they get infected? It's only a matter of time. And once you sweep away this idea that Indians are somehow exceptional, that we have great immunity, great genes, great exposure to bugs. All that stuff is irrelevant. It's actually nonsense because this is a new virus that none of us has experienced before, right? It is not as if we've, we've seen this before. So once you start with that starting point, you can pretty much each of you individually see where the situation is going, which is until everyone is either exposed to the disease or vaccinated, or a substantial number is at least, you know, till we get to this notion of what we call population immunity. We're basically in this game for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, but I'll stop there because I, you know, I'm sure we can play around with some of this, these themes, but this is the this is the base story. And this base story has not changed since last March. If if any of you wants to, you know, go back to you know an op-ed that I wrote in the New York Times at the end of March, and I looked at it recently and I said, you know, that story just did not change. We are particularly vulnerable because we have a population that has high degrees of hypertension and diabetes. And in fact, when we look back at this COVID, you know, 20 years from now, we'll realize that this was actually a disease of non-communicable diseases. It was a disease that affected you if you were hypertensive or diabetic or had, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or were obese. If you didn't, then you were largely spared the, you know, the worst effects of this virus. And in that sense, yes, it's a virus, but it is selectively gone after a particular population having these particular conditions and also obviously the older age groups. And the last thing I'll say is that once we have adjusted for age and once we have adjusted for uh, comorbidities uh, and we have more data than anyone does in the world, there is no difference between people in India than people in any part of the planet. 
And the places that appear to be better, whether it's Pakistan or Nepal or Bangladesh, are simply undercounting stuff. It is not like that they are much better than, than where we are either. It is simply, if you do the math correctly and you do the epidemiology correctly, every planet, every place on the planet is exactly the same with respect to individual susceptibility and case fatality rates.